Okay, I'm going to get started in about a minute. Alrighty, so welcome everyone. Once again, thank you for joining us today on this lovely Saturday afternoon. Today we are hosting the second edition of the Congolese Women's Forum. Um, as you know, our forum highlights Congolese women in the diaspora that are um, trailblazing and their own industries. And we are also creating a network to, you know, for learning, support, inspiration, development, and empowerment. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our moderator for the event. And uh, Cecilia will be joining us so she can introduce herself. Hey, hey, hey. Cecilia, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. Awesome, I know you're probably like nervous and excited on the inside, <laughs> but this yeah. is amazing. First of all, thank you to It's Kiki Sonabiso for having me. I am Congolese. I was born in the Congo in Kinshasa and we moved around quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I was living in before coming to America is South Africa, um, but we've lived in Kenya, Nigeria and a plethora of other places. Um, so I'm definitely an African child. Like there's no way you can rip me from that. Um, and it's here to moderate and to introduce some of the incredible women speakers who are going to really bless us and really encourage us on how to redefine um, and navigate this digital space as Congolese women. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so excited for the topic today. So um, as um, Cecilia mentioned, the topic today is redefining and navigating the digital space. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and, you know, introduce the speakers and I'm gonna go off stage and Cecilia is gonna be able to um, take it from here. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, hello, 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 welcome ladies. Um, I myself am excited, I am humble, I am gassed, I'm honored to meet all of you incredible women. Um, I do not like to introduce people because I want them to have the power to introduce and present themselves to the world. So I will go ahead on how I'm seeing the navigation on my end. So I'm gonna start with Esther, then Cindy, then Nicole. Um, if you wanna just tell us who are you so that people can have an understanding of who you are. Awesome. So hi everyone, my name is Esther Musuba Onema. I'm the middle child of three and I identify as Congolese American. I say this because although I've grown up in the United States for like the majority of my life, both my parents are from, um, they immigrated from, and they were born in the Congo. Uh, today, I am a full-time software engineer at Instagram where I work on making performance enhancements to the Instagram app. And then by night and in my free time, I'm the CEO and founder of My My Tech. My My Tech essentially started off when I was in university. Uh, I would do freelance app building and website building, but these days it is more of a volunteer initiative for helping the Congolese community in regards to STEM and uh, increasing their coding abilities. Hello, 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 everyone. My name is Cindy Makita Dodd. I'm so, so, so excited to be here. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, it is such a pleasure uh, to be here with you all today. And whenever I'm surrounded by a group of women, um, I'm always so excited and I feel empowered. So this is really, really great. Again, my name is Cindy Makita Dodd. Um, I was born and raised in South Africa, proudly Congolese. My parents migrated as well, so same as Esther, uh, from Congo to South Africa. Um, by profession, I am a career strategist and coach, I'm the founder of Hired Institute. Um, in my organization, in short, we help people land their dream jobs and accelerate to their next promotions. I'm also the founder of a digital marketing agency that my husband and I run together. Um, so entrepreneurship is pretty much my life and I really, really enjoy what I do. Um, I was recently crowned Miss African Roots, proudly representing DRC as well. Um, and my platform is focused on highlighting um, and advocating for the empowerment of, of women. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Super excited about this talk. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I think I, I will be the less uh, comfortable with the English today. So be good with me. I will make a lot of mistakes. So uh, I'm Nicole Kobe. I'm French Congolese, and um, I was born in the Congo. Then my parents moved in, 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 Fr in France. In, uh, in Normandy, I, where I grew up. Then after my graduation, I moved in Paris. For now, I live in Paris for 20, 20 years and in France for almost all my life. Um, what could I say about me? I, I don't know how to introduce myself, I'm sorry. I, I don't know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Nicole Kobe, I'm an, I'm an artist, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, I am um, I'm a storyteller, um, and, um, and voila. <laughs> I love that. I love that. See, I love allowing women to introduce themselves because a lot of times we're just told, here's what you are, do your thing, you know, but mm -hmm. this what you do, who you are. And it's lovely to well, it's okay. English is what our third, fourth language, most of us. So it's not even a big deal at all. Um, so I want to get into the we're talking about redefining, navigating the digital space, especially coming from a like COVID, um, the moment where the digital space has been more relevant. What do you think the importance of knowing your culture? Um, how are you making your culture relevant in the digital space? Um, so I want to go ahead and start with Cindy. We'll go to Esther and then we'll end again with Nicole. So go ahead. So just to clarify your question, you were breaking up a little bit, Cecilia. Um, you asked how important your culture and how you um, pretty much navigate your culture in the digital space. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, I got it. I got your question. Perfect. Um, so thinking about the importance of um, knowing your culture, I think that um, identity plays a huge part in our in our daily lives and and in who we are, right? And how we interact with the world, how we interact with one another. It all stems from our identity and our foundation. Um, you think about just the in the world that we live in, so many people um, seek out answers to try and identify like, where am I from and um, where do my roots lie? You see millions of people across the world um, do those ancestry or DNA tests and things like that just to find out their culture, to know where their roots are from. Um, because as humans, um, we want to be part of something, right? We want to be part of community. And that's where our culture stems from. So I think the importance of knowing your culture it forms the foundation of not only who you are. Um, I feel like if you if you don't know your starting point and you don't know who you are, you don't know and you can't know where you're going. Um, so for me, I know that the sacrifices that my parents, that my forefathers and foremothers made, um, it brought me to where I am today, right? And it's all stemmed from my culture and my roots. And I would be remiss to not recognize that and acknowledge that in my day-to-day -day life. So um, I think navigating culture in, in the world that we live in today, it stems from number one, knowing who you are, knowing your identity and, and being proud of that and, and finding ways to um, not only step into that authentically um, in what you do, right? I think authenticity plays a big part of it. Um, I'll share a little bit of my story. I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I grew up, I was born and raised in South Africa. Um, and I always, for a very, very long time growing up, I would just say, I'm South African, I'm South African, I'm South African. Um, my parents, of course, they were Congolese. Um, they brought us, all, brought us up in tradition, um, Congolese food, music, dancing, all of that. Um, but as a young girl, I wanted to fit in, right? I didn't want to be the outsider. I didn't want to be the person that wasn't from right, South Africa, or, you know, you just kind of have this, this wanting for belonging and to be a part of, of a group, especially growing up, trying to identify yourself. Um, and I remember a specific instance um, growing up that, um, of course, I grew up in South Africa and xenophobia was and is still a very, very real thing. Um, and I remember I had family members that stayed in Johannesburg in the city. And there was a rise in, in xenophobic attacks at the time. And they had to come and stay with me and my family who lived in the suburbs, which was a little bit further out from the city, um, because the rise in xenophobia was so bad. And um, those xenophobic attacks were perpetrated against foreigners, against Congolese people and people from outside of South Africa or who were from outside of South Africa. And I think that specific point kind of triggered in me like, hey, um, know your roots, know your identity. Like, yes, you were born and raised in South Africa, but 
where do your roots stem from? You're Congolese. And, and, and that was kind of the turning point for me to be proud of it. Um, and I started, you know, after that to really learn more about my culture and to learn more about where I was from. Um, and now I, I proudly recognize um, that I'm Congolese and I step into that. Um, so part of being successful, I think, in career and in life is, is knowing where you're from, um, knowing your foundation and your roots, um, and knowing that it kind of, it forms the foundation before you can even move forward. If you don't know where you're from, you can't know where you're going. So mm. I hope that answers your question, Cecilia. Yes, yes, absolutely. Man, that was like hitting to the point. I had so many things to take out of that. Um, and Esther, what about you? How, how do you think the importance of knowing your culture has played this relevant role in your digital space? Yeah, so I really think the importance of knowing your culture is more so the importance of knowing yourself. Um, fortunately, all of us here are lucky enough to say, like, you know, we, we know where our grandparents are from. And with that, um, I represent my culture in the digital space by just spelling out fully my full Congolese name. Um, I don't just say Esther and like give myself a random last name, but I'm proud to hold like Musube Onema as my last name because I understand that when people see my last name in the digital space, it's going to spark conversation. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that, you know, DRC is a country. They don't even know where it is. But I know that when I put Esther Musuba Onema, um, it's going to spark conversation in the sense that people ask, oh, I've never heard that before. Where's that name from? And, you know, the subject of Congo comes up. So that's how I represent my culture in the digital space. Wow, that is, that is, you use the most simple thing, which is a name, to, to trigger people into understanding that, no, I am part of this difference in our conversation. I am bringing in myself, even if people don't bring you in. So it's, it's the power of introduction. Um, and what about you, Nicole? How, how, how is the importance of knowing your culture um, helped you navigate this digital space? Um, okay. Um, what can I, I don't know. It's very is my knowing my culture, my Congolese culture, um, change a lot about um, what I'm doing now. But in the same time, I've, um, growing up in France, being French and, and African, what you can see in France, you can see. And I know where I'm from because we in, it's a francophone country, and there are a lot of Congolese in, in, in France in Paris. Of course, and um, in the same time, in my work, it was very important for me to be very uh, professional and to do it very good because I feel like in, growing up in France and being French at the same time, it's like Congolese people, they, they don't give us, um, we don't have this good image compared to the other African people, uh, French African people. I always feel like, Congolese, they have a bad image of Congolese. For example, they say Congolese bleach them, them skins, they Congolese this, Congolese that. And it's true because you have a, a, a big, a lot of people, a lot of Congolese who are doing bad things. So they feel like Congolese, all Congolese are like this. And for me, I'm very proud to be, actually for me, it's strange to say I'm Congolese because I, were, I, I was born in Zaire, Zaire and, uh, and in France we always say Zaire was. So for me, I'm most Zaire, Zaire from Zaire than Congo. Con that, I don't know how to explain that. I feel, I'm, I feel more Zaire, from Zaire than from Congo. I don't know how to explain that. And I feel like in France, uh, it's very um, it's very normal for someone to say, oh, I'm from Zaire, then to say I'm from Congo. So um, being some, when, when we grew up, in France, being from Zaire wasn't wasn't a good thing. Like we have this long name, we didn't have a uh, first name, prénom. We didn't have any because we were born during Mobutu thing, Mobutu um, uh, government. So it was very complicating to say, "Oh, I'm Congolese," because people have so many cliches about Congolese. Congolese uh, have long name. Congolese have this and that. Then uh, we have this new generation of Congolese who come uh, not not only with uh, with the uh, this culture, uh, culture of music and art and all these things. We, the new generation of Congolese in France, we try to do our best in everything we are doing. We are, we don't, ha we don't want to have this image that they, uh, with all these cliches they put on Congolese people. So 
Um, so yeah, so in my work, I, I, feel, I always feel as a black person in, in European and as a Congolese person, I can't do bad. I have to do always good. I, I, I don't have the right to do, um, to make any mistakes because people are waiting for me and they're just waiting to say, oh, you see, she's doing bad because she's Congolese. Congolese people do this way. So it's it's always like I have to, I don't, I feel, I don't feel like I have to prove, but I know for myself, maybe because my parents that uh, educate me like this way, raise me this way, but I always feel like I have to do better. I, I don't have the right to do to do wrong. So, yeah. Wow. That's a very, very important point about how your culture can cross into your work, into your environment, into your community, to where you become the representation for everybody else. Um, whether you're choosing, like you mentioned, Nicole, you, you're not trying to prove anything, but at the same time, you are the proof of everything for other people who have maybe um, had bad experiences with Congolese or don't even know Congo. Um, like, 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 um, um, Esther, I think you mentioned of where people don't know where Congo is. They don't know what Congo is. I think it's very important that, that you mentioned that, you know, for you, you, you don't have to prove anything to these people, but you do understand the role and the importance of who you are. Um, I absolutely appreciate that. And, and as someone who also describes herself as a, as a storyteller, Nicole, I definitely get where you're coming from with you know, you are the one who carries the understanding of your own story. Um, so if we switch into that, how I, I'm very curious as to how you women were able to get into the different industries that you are in. What was the moment in your life that led you to the work that you're doing now? And I know we're all doing very different things. So if you want to quickly recap what you're doing and just explain how you got into what you're doing for other people who are maybe curious. Um, and I do want to remind you guys, have like a two minute time cap thing for for answers <laughs> so just think about that um let's go ahead and start with esther then we'll go to nicole and then we'll end with cindy so for those that don't know i'm a software engineer at instagram uh overhead i just make performance enhancements to the app and i got into the field of software engineering ironically because my dad was a software engineer uh, he's been programming since the late 80s, early 90s, got his full-time job as a software engineer, and I would see him work from home a lot, which I found to be really cool. One day I asked him, like, I think I was like in the first or second grade, can you teach me how to program? And he said, of course, uh, being the great Congolese father, he is supportive in everything that, um, that I do. So then from there, um, I decided to major in computer science in college. Uh, by chance, I got a random interview from Facebook. I passed the interviews and uh, I got an internship with the company. I was interning with Facebook for two years straight. And then eventually I was like, all right, I'm ready to come in full time. And now I'm at the company within the Instagram department. So yeah, that's several moments actually led me to where I am today. That is awesome. That's awesome. And Come on, girl, you know, you can do your thing. Okay. All right. And what about you, Nicole? How did you get, because I know you're an artist and you're more than that um, entrepreneur and things like that. So how did you get that space? Oh, okay. So uh, for me, I, um, okay, I, I, I wasn't, I, okay, I always used to draw, but I, um, I didn't have my graduation in history art in France. So I stopped doing drawing, painting, all these art things. So I work in corporate um, assurances, insurances for eight, eight years, but I didn't feel totally complete and happy doing that. So I we start drawing and I start posting my, my art on, on, on Instagram, but at the same time, I didn't want my, my friends, people around me knowing that it was me just because my parents, my, not my parents, but my my, my teachers really uh, discouraged me and criticized what I was doing, drawing black women, doing, it wasn't enough, it, it wasn't where, where, what they were expecting from me. It was, it was too contemporary, it was too this and too that. So I went on social media, I, I didn't want to post anything about myself, I, didn't, I just want to post uh, 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 what I was drawing just to see, because I saw other people from other um, community doing that. So I was like, I, I don't see anyone who, who looks like me, so let's try to post Things. So I, I just started posting on social media and mostly on, on Instagram and voila, where, where, where I am now. 
awesome. And and I love that story because you basically were saying, you know, this, I'm going to show my art regardless of what art teachers have said, regardless of what people who are experts have said and about proving to the world that I can do this and you did it. So the mm -hmm. best of can't do something, you can. You just have to go out there and do it. What about you, Miss Cindy? Yes. Um, so growing up, I always had a really big passion for people um, and for impact, but I didn't really know exactly how that would translate into a career. Um, so I moved to the US. I was studying international business and, and finance. I got a job after I graduated working in asset and wealth management. I was doing really, really well in my role, but I got to a place where I felt really stuck. Um, I wasn't fulfilled in my job, right? Kind of um, similar to what Nicole said, um, there was something that was missing, right? There was, I was lacking something. Um, at the time, I would get a lot of questions from my peers about how I landed my job in wealth management. Um, so because I was getting all of these questions, I started a blog and I started writing about resumes, interview preparation, et cetera, and helping people land jobs. So my blog started getting traction. Um, people were implementing the advice that I was giving and, and landing amazing jobs. Um, and so kind of in that, um, in the place where I was in peak frustration at my corporate job, um, I saw the opportunity to um, take the leap into uh, career coaching and career strategy. Um, and I went full-time into entrepreneurship from there. So it was kind of at a point where uh, my career was challenged and where I felt frustrated. And I think out of challenges is where um, opportunities come and where they lie. So um, that challenging aspect of my life really propelled me into what I'm doing today. Um, and I absolutely love what I do. I get to help people land their dream jobs every day as well. So it's very, very fulfilling. That was awesome. I just want to say, I just want to brag a little bit on Liz on and on It's Viso Naviso. I, I don't know if people understand, you have someone in STEM, if I'm not correct, Esther, you're in STEM. Is that is that how to? Yes. So you have them, you have someone in career development and you have an artist. Excuse me, where else are you going to find three people like this? Okay, who are all Congolese? Like this is one of those things that excites me because women literally can do ev anything and everything. Um, and I didn't get to introduce myself, but I am a storyteller. Um, I currently work in advertising, so I do copywriting. Um, and on the side, I have other um, mediums of storytelling that I do with uh, creative directing. Um, and just recently finished directing my first documentary, which is coming out very soon. So it, it's incredible how there is literally no position that you can put a Congolese woman and she won't be able to rise to the occasion. Um, so if we switch into that, how were you guys able to redefine this business, this career that you've come in th into during the pandemic? Um, let's go ahead and start with Nicole, then we'll go to Cindy and end with Estes. So how were you able to redefine your business during the pandemic? Uh, um, actually, for me, it doesn't change a lot. I, I really, um, I feel like nothing changed a lot because I have a, um, a boutique online. I have, um, uh, okay, my work, I always work online already since uh, I start. So nothing changed. Uh, and I, as I'm working on, I'm working now on, on, in production, it's always like, uh, for, no, nothing changed for, for, for where. So I, I know there, there are a lot of things changed in different businesses, but the, the only thing that was really changed for me is like I was, I, I, it was the time I want to open a, 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 gallery, a art gallery in Paris and in New York. And now I know like it's not the moment, And uh, but nothing changed for me really. I just feel like I was lucky to start being um, working online uh -huh. for a few years ago. And I feel like now I, yeah, so nothing changed really for me. That, that's <laughs> an important point. When you're ahead of the curve and walking on and working online, it's like when everybody else was stuck online, I'm just like, oh, okay, like welcome to the world that I was in already. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in France, when I was work, living in France, by example, I have all, 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 most of my clients in the US. So I was always like on the phone on, on, online and work. So, nothing really changed. So uh, I feel like I was maybe a little bit uh, uh, avant-gardist. I was uh, in, uh, I don't know how you say it in English. I was, um, I stopped earlier doing what people are doing now. So 
After, you know, I, I was very stressed, stressed, like, oh, what happened on the boutique? Maybe things will change, people. But I feel like people spend more time online, so people, so, so the selling are getting better. And, and, but in the same time, I, yeah, I feel like I, I don't need to readapt myself a lot. I don't know if you saw um, readapt. No, no, no. <laughs> Okay. I'm so happy that like nothing really changed for you because or at least things improved because that's a really great point about being in honing different aspects of of the industries um can really help you like you mentioned you were like oh let me go into this uh boutique and actually open a space and the world is like nope don't do that you know stay online stick to what you're doing Yes. And one, maybe one of the, the only big change we have is like shipping between different countries. countries. Like we, we are, I was in New York and when we move in, in France, we have to reorganize everything. Like people in New York would only ship things in, in, in New York. And so we, we change just a little bit, but in the same time, it's, it was a good decision to make. Like we can ship things from France to the US um, like we used to. So we have to remove our. I don't know how you say that in English, but I was talk place. Yeah. So we just reorganize a little bit. Yeah. And that's very smart. One thing you mentioned there is just the thought, the planning the process of it all. And I think people who are online, I think, had to do a lot more of a okay, let's process this, let's understand how we can make this work the way that it is already working. Um, mm -hmm. so 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 what about who was next? I totally lost who was my next person. Cindy, go ahead. Yes. So how I redefined my business in uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I started my business in January 2020. So this was right before the pandemic hit in March. Um, I was kind of thinking maybe this was a bad idea uh, starting my business uh, in 2020. Um, but I, I had that vision that I really wanted to see it succeed. And I knew um, the amount of people that it could help. So when March 2020 hit and the pandemic hit, um, Hyatt Institute was perfectly positioned to help the millions of people that had been laid off, furloughed, um, actually get back into the workforce. Um, so I think the pandemic defined my business uh, more than anything. Uh, but what we did do was help career professionals redefine their careers. Um, so I think very often, um, just naturally as, as humans and, and as professionals, we think that um, our careers are like one way, one lane highways, right? We think that if I'm in a certain industry, I have to stick to that industry. Um, and what we taught a lot of our clients um, was that your career is not defined by a job title um, and that at any point, if you're self-aware and you know certain skills, um, you can pivot your career at any point. So we really helped many career professionals um, transition and pivot their careers during the pandemic um, simply by helping them identify their skills, transferable skills, identify their experiences, um, and really help people detach themselves, like I said, from their job titles. Um, very often, you know, we can say like, hey, I'm a career strategist or um, I'm, a, I'm a programmer or I'm a project manager. And we attach ourselves to our job titles, right? And when something like the pandemic hits, um, and those job titles are removed, we can left, be left feeling stuck or um, confused or um, not knowing what step to take next. So we helped people um, not only understand that companies are still hiring, and if you know how to properly brand yourself, you can pivot and transition your career at any point. Um, we really help people get back onto the job market uh, fast. So not only did the pandemic define um, the business Hyatt Institute, but we helped many people redefine their careers, which I think is really important. Um, you look at industries like the hospitality industry or events, right? So industries that were completely shut down during the pandemic, those millions of people that used to work in those industries, they still had an opportunity to find other jobs simply by being able to identify their skills and knowing that they weren't attached to their job titles. Wow. And that's, that's really something like, first of all, I am blown away by your business and, and how you guys were able, like, first of all, you guys have some luck because you came like right at the peak of when people needed you. Like, it wasn't even a joke. Like sometimes I was going through Cindy's stuff because I stalk all of you. I love you guys. Um, I was going through Cindy's stuff and I was like, wow, this is very useful information. Like the, it's right here for people to understand that the pandemic is not shutting you out of a job but in fact if you're wise about it if you think about it and if you if you put yourself in the right positions it can direct you to the job that you need 
actually the job that needs you. So, so it, this is some incredible stuff to hear about. And what about you, Ms. Esther? Uh, so like Nicole, my job didn't change too much due to the pandemic because, you know, I could just open my laptop and work from anywhere I want. But in terms of Instagram and life and the projects at Instagram, due to the pandemic, a lot more people started spending more time on their phones, which meant there was more of a push to push out changes and products that make the app experience better for the user. Um, I joined Instagram full time right when the pandemic started. So I was fortunate enough to be offered to be placed on a team that focuses on making Instagram stories appear better, faster, content loading, and that sort of thing. Um, and then additionally with my, my tech, I realized that unfortunately a lot of people did lose their jobs to the pandemic. And I really just wanted to give back and focus more of my time within my, my tech, giving back to the community answering questions that I can regarding software engineering and software development and just bettering people's, I guess, coding expertise. So, yeah. No, and that's really incredible because sometimes my biggest fear is that they're going to shut off the internet one day and I won't have a job. <laughs> so like literally that's a big fear of mine. So to have someone who's saying, hey, you know, my job doesn't stop because you kind of were running the internet, if I can say. Like, you kept us going. Because low-key, all I did was watch memes and, like, watch movies and, like, write for work. But 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 people who are in development, people who are in tech, you guys have a very, very key job. Like, without you guys, the, what the world was expecting to fall back on, which is this online-based society it's because of you guys and certain industries in other countries don't have tech as available to be able to fall back on that. So to be in a position where we can say, you know, Nicole can say, Hey, my business didn't change. We were good. You know, for Cindy to say, Hey, I actually kicked off my business in this time for you Esther to say, we kept it going means that you were a, you were in a position to where you could redefine what it meant to be in the pandemic in your career simply because you thought you focused and you chose the the position that would help you the best um um and and and, and to go into that aspect of digital space what do you think are some of the most valuable attributes pertaining to the to the digital space that you would tell a user or a viewer or someone who's just listening what what are some valuable at attributes to the digital space so let's go with Esther and then we'll go to Nicole and then we'll end with Cindy. I would say one of the most valuable attributes is that knowledge is free. Um, I don't know if anyone else has realized this, but we're extremely blessed to grow up in a generation where knowledge is easily and readily available at our fingertips. I can Google, how do I code this project in Python? Or how do I make a bot? anything of that such. So I think the most valuable attribute is free knowledge and really capitalizing off of that. We are just so lucky, guys. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, you definitely have that knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. What about you, Nicole? Oh, wait, Nicole, you're mute. <laughs> no, I'm still, I just, I'm just thinking. I'm just, if, if uh, someone else can, can replay and then I will with my response. Yes, um, some of the most valuable attributes of the digital space. Um, I think two things. The first is proximity, right? We literally have access to opportunities at like the touch of a button. Um, as a job seeker or somebody that's looking for their next opportunity, you have resources like LinkedIn that can literally put you in touch with your dream companies. Um, so that proximity aspect of it and access to opportunities is, it's crazy to think about, right? And um, on the other side, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you have access to tapping into and getting in touch with your ideal audience or potential customers. Um, so the proximity that the digital space provides um, gives us access to to opportunities on on such a, a crazy level. Um, so that's kind of the one thing. And the second is, I, I just think of it as the ability to inspire. Um, we see so much going on in the news um, and even online, um, and a lot of it is is negative. But just through the digital space, we have the opportunity to inspire, to spread 
positivity, to spread love. Um, and, and, I, and I see it as, as a responsibility, right? Um, yes, we, we want to show up authentically. We want to show up as our true selves. Um, and, and sometimes that means spreading, spreading inspiration and spreading love to others. And um, we get to connect with people that spread those messages um, of positivity in a world that is flooded with um, a lot of negativity. I think that that's a beautiful thing that the digital space um, allows us to see. That is awesome. That is awesome. Nicole, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not mute. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, the most important thing um, with the, the digital um, space is like we, uh, we still, okay, have a small business and we have three uh, offices one here, one in Paris, one in New York, and one in, in, in South Africa. And we still like, we, we still a, a team. We, 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 um, we help each other every day and we work like we, we work in the same space and it's very uh i'm very happy to make this uh, this um, um team working together and we feel like we all uh like in the same space and i feel like digital is working this way as i said I, we, we we work this way for for now seven years and i feel like it's it's um it's the best creation um for for uh the workspace actually for me I don't know if, if it was enough clear. Awesome. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I was enough clear in English. But I, I know how to say that in French, but I have to think twice. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. And that was, um, as someone who has a platform, my platform, Forgotten Magic, is completely digital. Um, um, there are some spaces where I get to do things in person and somewhere I don't. And um, it was really the pandemic that taught me hey, why, why are you trying to run away from a position that allows you to connect with a lot more people? Um, so I have people from Europe, people from Australia. I remember I was on a call with someone in Australia and it was like 2 a.m. in Australia and we were talking and just chatting away and planning the conference. And I just sat there thinking, if I didn't have this medium of the digital space, would I be able to contact this person? Would I have been able to get them to be part of this platform? Would I be able to share my platform with a with hundred and I think we had 136 people from across the world. So it's one of those things where we, we always downplay the, the importance of the digital, the digital space, but in actual fact, it's really powering a lot of our different movements, our mediums. So it's, it's really, really great to hear that. Um, so um, I do have individual, individual questions um, that I'm gonna ask each of you, but before I go into that, I just kind of want you guys to have a moment um, to just answer uh, what are what does community mean to you, and, and how can we as a community support you guys? Before we go into the into the into the individual questions, now this one is open for anybody because the individual questions are like paired kind of to each person. So 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 whoever wants to go in for this question, um, go ahead, or I can start and and kind of let you guys think about it for a second. For me, community means that I have people who I can talk to, call. Um, and it doesn't matter where they are. Like, I really like the aspect of my sister is in South Africa and, and I can text her today and call her and talk to her as if she's here with me. Community means that I can share a project and ask people, hey, can you look at this? Can you give me your input? Community means I can support a friend, even if I'm not with them, if they tell me they start a new boutique. So, so community just means the reach I have between people doesn't have to be close for me to to feel close to them, if that makes sense. So who else wants to jump on that question? I'll go ahead. Um, I think similar to how you mentioned, Cecilia, I think that community is strength. I really think that there is power in community. Um, there's a quote that says, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much, right? And when I think about that concept um, of community, it's an opportunity for us to share or to give support, uh, to give guidance, to share resources with one another with the ultimate goal of empowering or, or uplifting each other, right? I think back on um, the fact that I couldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for my community, my family, um, support networks, mentors, etc. cetera. Um, they give you support. They give you guidance. They give you access to resources. Um, and kind of the second part uh, to your question, Cecilia, which was, 
how can we as a community better support you? I think just having platforms like this, like Biso Na Biso, that brings people together, um, that gives us access to hear each other's stories, um, the challenges, the struggles, but also the successes, it's inspiring, right? And the same thing, together, we can do so much. There's really power um, in community when we can collaborate, when we can um, utilize each other's strengths to uplift one another and share resources. There's really nothing more powerful than that. Um, so I look at community as a source of, of strength and, and, and power. That is awesome. That is awesome. Anybody else want to take it? Anybody else? You don't have to. <laughs> Um, I guess I would like to add that, uh, like Cindy said, I think community is about supporting each other. And especially like in this community, the Congolese community, the Black community, I think it's extremely important that we support each other, regardless of like where we're at in our levels or our salaries, right? Um, I, I always work as if I want to see someone do better than myself. So uh, community to me is selflessness and wanting the people around you to do better than yourself, or at least get to your level. Yes, yes, that is that is very awesome. And I love that you mentioned the pay bracket because I think that sometimes pushes people back from being part of a community because, oh, they're making more money than me, so they don't need me. But it's, it's us together, it's the unity of us together that helps us go further. Nicole, do you have anything you wanna to add to that before I go into individual questions? Yeah, I think this question is very American. That's why I, I don't know if I can reply to this. Uh, you know, we don't think like community of these things. So I, uh, I think it's very American to say, oh, the community of these things. And um, so I, uh, I don't know. Okay, my, what, I don't know. I don't know what, which community are we talking about. Uh, uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Like the people that support you, that is technically. Oh, the people that support your business are technically community. So it's just a grouping of people. So your community can be your family because technically, you know, you're closest to them. Your community can be the people who are literally around you, like where you live. And then your community can also be your cultural community. So like all of us being Congolese women, we are of one community since we are from one place. So it's just something that brings you guys together, forms a community. So like the people who support you in your business, they are technically your community because they allow your business to grow because they always buy or they always support or they always you know show up for everything that you do so the the idea of community that is very true that's a good point it's very american um to some extent i think because in in certain african countries we have the idea of community we just don't categorize things i think it's very american to name things and to categorize this is what this is so i understand why it's like oh that's very american and i'm like yeah i agree <laughs> it is <laughs> but so i do have individual questions for everyone um i'm gonna go ahead since we just ended with nicole i'm gonna start with uh, cindy and then just move out to esther and end with nicole so for cindy um being a career strategist how do we take our careers more seriously in our community? That's a great question. Um, I always have like two part answers, so I'll be quick, but my two part answer to how do we take our careers more seriously? Um, I think one aspect is being self-aware, which we briefly touched on um, early on. It's knowing what you're really good at, what your strengths are, where your skills lie as well, um, knowing and having a deep understanding of where your weaknesses are and you know areas that you don't like as much in the workplace. Self-awareness forms the basis of a successful career um, and you're able to define and redefine your career at any point when you have that basis of self-awareness. And then the second part of it is having goals for your career, right? What is that long-term vision? What is that big picture that you're working towards. Maybe it's a specific job title. So maybe it's um, the CEO of a company, whatever that looks like for you. Um, without a goal, without direction, without a vision, um, you cannot know where you're going. And so when you're thinking about taking your career seriously, it's having what is that end goal or what is the big goal that I'm working towards? And then mapping out from there, what career steps and decisions do I have to make? Who do I have to surround myself with? What skills do I have to gain or knowledge do I have to acquire to be able to get me there? 
So two parts to get to a successful career. Number one is self-awareness. It's knowing yourself really, really well. And then number two, it's having career goals, having that trajectory um, that you're working towards. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with that. And then the reason why we put the, the, the part of seriously is because I think sometimes people think you get a job, that's your job. Like you're stuck there. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing else to go up or down towards. But I think I love the fact that you, you, you mention like having goals. Like sometimes people forget that there is a need for goals within a job because we're, we're past the baby boomers age where, where you get stuck in a, in a job for five, 20, 30 years. Um, um, so that's a very good point. So for you, Esther, what are some points um, you could give to other Congolese women that are looking to pursue um, uh, um, just software engineering um, or as you would be in, in, in your position? I want to say software development, but software engineering. And you can correct me. From no, you're absolutely right. It is software engineering. So three things. Um, the first thing is most importantly, you have to practice. I think a lot of people have the misconception that software engineering and coding is something that could be mastered like within a month when that's absolutely not true. You have to practice every single day, whether that be coding algorithms, uh, interview prep, and just learning how to solve complex problems within the digital space, like that's point number one. With that, point number two, I would say, is internships, internships, internships. Um, I graduated with a lot of people who had higher marks than me, were I guess smarter than me on paper, but when it was time to graduate, they didn't graduate with jobs because they didn't have the internship experience that I had. Um, so most importantly, focus on gaining the company experience rather than you know scoring the highest marks on your test because at the end of the day, an employer isn't looking at your GPA, at least in software engineering, an employer is looking at your relevant experience. Do they trust you as a software engineer to bring onto the team? And the last thing is never give up. Um, as a woman and a black woman in software engineering, um, there were a lot of instances and still today where I'm the only person that looks like myself either in the workplace, in the classroom, just wherever I go. But most importantly, you shouldn't let that deter you. And you should actually challenge yourself to befriend the people who don't look like you, who don't come from backgrounds that like yourself. Because in my experience, I've learned the most from people who don't look like me at all. And if it wasn't for me reaching out and networking, I wouldn't have the career that I have today. So, yeah. Awesome. You mentioned you mentioned um, um, practice, you mentioned internships, and you mentioned don't give up. And I think those can go into whatever medium people choose to go into. Um, um, and, and I like how you describe internships as company experience, because I think people sometimes try to make it fancy. And I'm like, bro, if you're trying to be in business, just go work at a business. Like It really is just the experience that you need to show that you can do what you say you want to do. Um, so Nicole, my last question for you um, is, this one is specifically from Liz. Um, how has being an artist prepared you um, as you pivot into TV and media? So how has that prepared you? Prepare. <laughs> no, it, nothing was prepared as since the beginning, actually, things are coming to me and thank God for that. And um, I, it, for me, was really the, the next step on in my career. I, I was feeling like, okay, I'm, I love illustration, but now I feel like I, I need to do something new. And, uh, and I feel like it's really the... Um, yeah, the, 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 next, the next chapter is very exciting. And I'm, I feel like, I, I, the funny thing, as I said, I, I learn everything day by day and um, I have any um, diploma, you say that, I don't know, graduation on, on that. And I'm learning different job like every day. Like for me, it's, um, it's a very exciting um, moment. Like just when I start drawing on uh, and posting on social media so it's really a new chapter a new a new step yeah so um i'm learning every day awesome. so i feel like everybody learn every day mm, yes <laughs> and i love how you mentioned this is this is something you plan from the beginning but you, this is also learning every day um that way you're literally telling people that 
there is thoughts that have to happen in the beginning. There's preparation that needs to happen in the beginning. But at the same time, every day you pick up steps, you see what's working, what's not working. And I really love that. So we are about to close this fun, fun question. It's my favorite question. I'm going to go ahead and bring up Liz. Liz, if you want to come back up so we can end with my favorite question. And everybody's going to know why this is my favorite question. So thanks to the pandemic, but I feel like I always do this regardless of the pandemic. We are all snacking. Okay, don't lie. I know you've all been snacking those little packets in your room, stuff like that. Um, so what, what's your favorite snack? Like, what is your go-to thing you'd like to munch in the middle of the night? Um, let's start with Liz, since you just joined us. Oh, um, I think for me is, um, almonds. I just, they're it's very easy, very healthy. It's like, so I'm overly snacking, but I'm still being healthy with my almonds. So, um, those have been my go-to this whole pandemic. Right, right, right. Okay, a little snack. You're cheating, but you're not cheating. Exactly. Yes. What about you, Esther? What's what's been the go-to? You know, I know y'all something. You always got something. Yeah. Um, I will say following the healthy dried cranberries. Those are those are my favorite. Okay. Okay. I didn't. I'm dry. I'm about to go cook. Okay. Great. Noted. Nicole, what about you? What's a snack you like to eat? When you're working, you know, you're doing your thing. Okay. I I gained a lot in the US, so now I try to be very uh going back to my French um diet. So I will say when I'm very I, I need a big one, I will take bread with um uh, fromage, how do you say cheese? Yeah. Uh, but but to be serious, it will be a good green apple. <laughs> apple? Yeah, I'll be like what? Okay, Cindy. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm on the healthy thing too. So I'm, same as Liz, almonds, um, and then a little bit of Esther's one too, but dried mangoes. Oh, okay. No, dried mangoes are a thing. Like they, they, they go hard. Yeah, it's <laughs> really no, good. highly recommend. Uh, I, I'm mad because I low key feel like I'm the only person that really doesn't have a snack. I like food in general, so I have like a junk cupboard with like packet of chips, chocolate. I'm I'm basically making use of my fast metabolism right now because it's it's not going anywhere. So I'm just I'm snacking. I'm snacking. But it's gonna hit at 30. So I know it's gonna hit at 30. So I'll jump to your bandwagon with the apples and the almonds. Um 